Well, welcome to Mount Carmel Baptist Church, the online edition. This is our Wednesday night Bible study. Appreciate you tuning in tonight. We've been going through uh, the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And we've been looking at what it means to have Jesus in our life and have that lived out in our life. By the way, just sort of some homework for you. Go and read the few verses in front of the verses that we've been studying. And what you'll find is a list of what it doesn't look like to be a believer. You, you're going to be reading words like the works of the flesh. Then you read adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. There's an entire list of what it looks like when we are not living out the Holy Spirit in our lives. Then we get to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and it tells us what it does look like. And so we're, we've been going through piece by piece what it looks like when we are living a Spirit-powered life. And so, here in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, the Bible says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless our efforts tonight, bless this Bible study, use it, to make us more like Jesus and less like the old person we used to be. And if there is somebody who doesn't know you, I pray, Lord, that you could use this Bible study tonight to help them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you for all that you've done for us, all that you're going to do for us. But above all things, thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, before we get into this particular passage and what that means... I want to take you to Luke chapter 18. Because the word we're looking at here is goodness, and it means uprightness of heart and life. So what does it mean to be good? Or what does goodness mean? Well, Luke chapter 18 sort of gives us a visual picture of goodness and what goodness does and doesn't mean. And as we walk through that, in Luke chapter 18, a rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and he says, what do I need to do to enter into the kingdom of heaven. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Specifically says this, good master. That's what he calls Jesus, good master. What do I have to do to enter? What good thing? Good master, what good thing must I do to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Jesus stops him and says, why do you call me good? Before he answers his question, he says, why do you call me good? There's only one good, and it's God. And Jesus is right there's none good but God, and Jesus is God, and He is good. But the rich young ruler didn't know that. This rich young ruler didn't know that Jesus was God. He didn't really know He was good. So two interesting things. Number one, he calls Jesus good master. Number two, he says, what good thing must I do to enter into heaven? He is calling Jesus good because he was calling himself good. What good thing must I do? So Jesus finally does answer his question. He tells him the Ten Commandments, he leaves out one, but he tells him, starts through the Ten Commandments, and the guy says, oh, I've done all those things from my youth. Since I was a little bitty boy, I've always done what's right, Jesus. And Jesus says, all right then, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And he left sorrowful because he was rich. Nothing wrong with being rich, nothing sinful necessarily. It's nothing sinful to have riches. It's sinful when your riches have you, and they did. This fellow loved money. He was covetous. One of the Ten Commandments. And um, he wasn't going to sell his stuff because he wasn't good. Now, he said he was, and he said Jesus was, but he wasn't good. And then you get into Luke 18, 41. Just a few verses later, Jesus encounters a blind man. And uh, Jesus asks him, what shall I do for you? And so here's the, the, here's the contrast. You have one man who wants to be good without Jesus, and in another story, you have a man who wants to see by Jesus. One guy says, what must I do 
the other man says, Jesus, what can you do for me? And then you get into Luke 19, and Jesus goes to the house of Zacchaeus. And he certainly wasn't good. But he starts doing good after he receives the goodness of Jesus. And these stories, one guy who thinks he's good, one guy who is blind and needs help from Jesus, another guy who isn't good and who needs help from Jesus. They illustrate perfectly this idea of goodness. We are blind and we aren't good. Now we may not be physically blind, but we are spiritually blind and we aren't good. And if we want to see and we want to be good, we can try to do it on our own or we can let the Spirit work in us to produce goodness. And that's the options, that's the choices we have here. So how do you get goodness in your life then? How do you do that? Well, first of all, you have to love it. You have to love it. And we aren't going to love goodness until we love Jesus Christ. This is salvation. We receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ, His payment for our sins. Now the big church word for this is justification. Just as if I'd never sinned. Romans 5, 9 says this, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. This is what scholars call positional righteousness. So let me make this, try to make this simple, all right? This, so I can understand it. Let me make this simple. You and I are sinners. And what God does is, He takes us from the position of being a sinner and puts us in the place of righteousness, even though we're not righteous. He took Jesus and put Jesus in the place of the sinner, and He took the sinner and puts the sinner in the place of righteousness. Positional righteousness. It's as if you haven't sinned, even though you have. Jesus Christ took your sins on Calvary. He paid the price for your sins, and now He gives you His righteousness. You have positional righteousness. You are justified. We were sinners, and God puts us in the place of one who never sinned. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We are justified. We are positionally righteous. We are free from the penalty of sin. So you have to love righteousness. You have to love goodness. But you're not going to love goodness until you love Jesus. It starts with salvation. If you don't get that part right, you're not going to get any of the rest of it right. We read Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But verse 20, 24 says, And they that are Christ's, Verse 25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So this is talking about those who know Jesus, who are living out the life that they have in Jesus Christ. If you don't love Jesus, you're never going to love goodness. And if you aren't walking with Jesus, now we're getting to that point. If you're not walking with Jesus, you're not going to love goodness. You have to love it. And if you're going to love goodness, you have to love Jesus first. Now here's the good news for you. Jesus loved you before you ever loved Him. He died for you. He calls to you. He will save you if you'll ask Him. You have to love Him. And if you love Jesus, then you're going to love goodness. You have to love it, but then you have to learn it. So here's the thing. When we start talking about goodness, uprightness of heart and life, when we start talking about goodness... That means you have to know good from bad, right from wrong, good things from evil things. And so how in the world are you ever going to learn that? Are you just going to make it up as you go, figure it out on your own? I'm going to tell you how you're going to learn it. You're going to learn it from God's Word. You see, God has spoken. 
Not in a mystical, magical way out there, some voice that you hear somewhere off in the wind. I mean, God spoke to men who wrote His Word down. We have the Bible today. If you want to hear from God, you don't have to hear some voice somewhere. All you have to do is pick up your Bible and read it. Let me say this a little more clearly. If you're not willing to pick up your Bible, study it, and read it to hear God's voice, God is not going to blast it down from a loudspeaker from heaven so you hear an audible voice. If you're not going to study what He has already said, He sure isn't going to say anything else to you through some voice out there in the sky. Don't wait for God to give you some mystical, magical revelation. Start studying God's Word. God has spoken. He has told us good from bad, right from wrong, good from evil. Learn it. You have to love it, and you have to learn it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to learn it. Study the word. Listen to what God says. Learn right from wrong. Learn good from evil. We live in a world that doesn't know what's good. And people do all sorts of evil things and call it good. And I think to some degree, honestly and genuinely think they are doing good. And there are all sorts of sins that people commit, and they think in their mind they're doing what's good. But it's contrary to God's Word, it's sinful and it's evil. And we have to know good from bad, good from evil. So you read God's Word, you study it, you learn it. But then you have to live it. (laughs) James says it's not enough to be a hearer of the Word. He says we have to be a doer of the Word also. We have to take what we hear and read and learn in God's Word, and we have to apply it to our lives and learn to live what God has said for us. When we learn to live it, when we love God, we love goodness, and we learn it, and then we start to live it, something wonderful happens. When we read God's Word and we start letting it apply to our lives, God begins to use His Word and His Holy Spirit in combination to work in our life to produce goodness in us. We're not good in and of ourselves. But if we will submit ourselves to God's Word and His Holy Spirit, He will produce goodness in us. Goodness that we can't have on our own. We can't do it on our own. We'll never achieve it on our own. God will work in us to produce that goodness. Now we've read the fruit fruit of the Spirit in verses 22 and 23. Verse 25 says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit, that means salvation. Walk in the Spirit, that's sanctification. That's, that's, uh, where God, that's not just positional righteousness, where God moves you from being a sinner to being a saint, even though you're not perfect. That's positional righteousness. Now we're talking about practical righteousness, where God starts to work in us practically to produce good works, to produce righteous deeds. Verse 18 says, if, if Galatians 5 says, But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. So in verse 18 before this, he talks about the being led by the Spirit. In verse 25, he talks about walking in the Spirit. He says in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. Over and over and over again, this verse, this passage is saturated with us submitting to the Holy Spirit in our life, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, learning from the Holy Spirit, letting God's Word and God's Spirit work in our lives to produce something in us that we couldn't do on our own without God's work and God's help. You ever read about all the miracles that Jesus did in the Bible? You know, He walked on the water. He calmed the sea. He fed 5,000 people, really more than that, but He fed 5,000 men with with five loaves of bread and two fish. He healed a woman that had had an issue of blood for years and years and years.
years. He healed a crippled man who couldn't walk, who was lowered through the roof by his friends. They busted a hole in the roof and lowered him down. He healed that man. He gave sight to the blind. He healed lame legs. He called Lazarus, who came forth from the grave. Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle. The greatest thing He ever did was He died for your sins and rose from the dead. And if you ask Him, He'll save you. For some of you, He did that already. The greatest miracle that Jesus could ever perform in your life, He did it already if you're saved. He saved you. He gave you new, spiritual, eternal life. But it doesn't have to stop there. God can still do a miraculous work in your life, producing in you something you couldn't do naturally. That's really the definition of a miracle, is something supernatural. And... Uh, this is something supernatural. It's something only God can do. It doesn't happen naturally. Where God works in us to produce goodness. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. We've gone through the fruit of the Spirit, goodness. Paul told Timothy this. Timothy was a young preacher. And he wanted Timothy to be tethered to the Word of God, preaching the Word of God, teaching the Word of God, standing on the Word of God. And so he says this in 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then he says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Word perfect there doesn't mean sinless, it means complete. So the man of God can be complete. Everything you need to please God, you learn from His Word. God has spoken. Why are we not reading what He said, listening to what He said, learning from what He said, and letting God apply it to our life? We have to live it. It's not enough just to be saved. Listen, that's good, but that's not the end. That's just the beginning. It's not even enough just to read your Bible, although you certainly, certainly should read your Bible, but you also have to live it. The old adage, practice what you preach, that's what we're talking about here. We have to put into practice what God's Word says in our life, and we're not going to do it unless we're submitting to the power of the Holy Spirit as we read God's Word. God starts to produce in us Righteousness, sanctification. Justification happens instantly. The second you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, He forgives you. He has paid for all of your sins for all time. That's justification. But sanctification, becoming more like Jesus and less like the old person you used to be, that's sanctification. And that doesn't happen instantly. It happens gradually and progressively. You become more like Jesus, a little bit more, a little bit more all of your life. Less like the old person you used to be. God just continues to work in you. Making you more like Jesus. You have to love it. You have to learn it. You have to live it. And you have to long for it. See, while we walk with Jesus and we serve Jesus, and we become more like Jesus all of our Christian life and all of our Christian walk, none of us are perfect. And none of us will be perfect this side of glory. Some of you Christians know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you want to serve Jesus more. You want to be like Him more. And sometimes you fail and it just cuts you right to the heart. I mean, it just cuts to the quick because you know that you have not lived up to the standard that Jesus sets for us. And you want to be like Him, and you long to be like Him, and you're not like Him, not fully, not completely, not, not perfectly. We are not like Jesus yet, but one day we will be. Justification sanctification, and then glorification. One day, Jesus is going to come get us. And we're going to have a new glorified body. We're going to live forever in eternity. We will be free from the presence of sin. 
When we get saved, He frees us from the power, uh, from the penalty of sin. Excuse me. When we get saved, He frees us from the penalty of sin. He paid the price, and it's been paid. When we walk with Him through our Christian walk, sanctification, He frees us from the power of sin. We become more like Jesus, less like the old person we used to be. One day, He will free us from the presence of sin. One day, we will see Him face to face. One day, we will be like Him. John talks about that. First John chapter 3 says, Brethren, it doth not yet appear what we shall be. What we know we knows when, the, when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. One day, we will be like Jesus. Christian, don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. Don't quit serving Jesus. It is always and ever worth it. There is a reward to be gained. There is a Savior to come. There is a heaven that awaits. Don't ever stop serving Jesus. Let Him work in you to produce the goodness that you could never do on your own. Goodness. Just being good. It only comes through Jesus. Maybe you are watching this Bible study tonight and you have never asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins and be the Lord of your life. Jesus left the splendor and the glory of heaven where He was worshipped, served, and adored. He came to this earth. He was born a special, unique birth, a virgin birth. He lived a special, unique life, a sinless life, something you and I couldn't do. Jesus did. We're not good, and He is. He lived a sinless life. And then He died on the cross. When He died on the cross, He died in your place and in my place. He died for your sins and for my sins. On the third day, He rose from the dead, victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. If you will ask Him, Jesus will forgive you of your sins. He will save you. He has paid for your sins. And He will forgive you and wipe the slate clean. In the eyes of God, it will be as if you have never sinned, all because of Jesus. I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you want to be saved, if you want Jesus to forgive you of your sins and be the Lord of your life, if you pray this prayer with me, you'll be saved. Now, this prayer doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. But if you pray this prayer and you mean it, then you will have new, eternal, spiritual life. The prayer goes like this. Jesus, I know I have sinned. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I want you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to save me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now help me to live for you. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, I want to know about it. Contact me. Let me know about that. I want to talk with you. I want to pray with you. And I want to talk with you about what it means to live for Jesus Christ. Being saved is not the end. That's just the beginning. And I want to talk with you about how to walk with Jesus from here on out. But whatever decision you made, if there's a decision that you did make, let me know about that. And I want to talk with you and pray through you, with you through that decision. Remember this, wherever you are, if you're saved, wherever you are, Jesus is with you. You find some way, somehow, to share Jesus with somebody. Thanks for tuning in, and God bless.